a low level edu of education, but that's actually not true either. We see all kinds of people. Um, we see people who work as adjuncts, you know, adjunct professors, because they get paid by the course and they don't get health insurance. Um, and I also put in there all levels of healthcare literacy because that's a different kind of literacy that um, isn't just about can you read, but can you navigate our incredibly complex system of healthcare and our incredibly complex system of insurance. Next. Um, but most of our patients, the big uh, purple part of the pie is less than 30% of the median income uh, people, people making less than 30% of the median income in our county. Um, and the, the orange quarter is um, another people who are making less than 50%. So you can see the vast majority of our patients, um, even though they're very diverse in other ways, um, have in common that they're low income. Which means, which means what median income for you? Median income for Tompkins County depends on your family size. For a single person, um, oh, I can't, I'm sorry, I don't remember the, <coughs> I, I, I'm not remembering the exact figures, but um, it's a little bit higher than in some other places, um, but there's a lot of people. And you know, our, a Tompkins County is a pretty wealthy county for upstate. Um, our health outcomes numbers look good, our income numbers look good, <laughs> but that's because we have a, a wide range in there, a lot of people who are falling through the cracks. Well, our average age is very low, like 23 or something. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, you know, it's like the, it's, it's very easy for, so we, you know, we don't qualify for certain kinds of funding because um, our overall numbers are so good. But there's still gaps. Next slide. Um, that's just, you know, just so you get a sense of some of the different kinds of services that we offer. <clears throat> People coming for a doctor visit um, cannot make an appointment um, and all the other services are by appointment. Next slide. <clears throat> Another big thing that we do, um, and I put this under the health fund, but it really comes in all of our programs, is advocacy, patient advocacy, financial advocacy. Um, people call us for all kinds of questions. I mean, these are some of the specific organized things that we do where we actually have appointments with um, uh, financial advocates who can help anyone who's facing medical debt or um, who needs help with a prescription assistance program um, or uh, who needs help figuring out what they need. Um, so we have appointments for that. Um, we don't do insurance enrollment, but we, have, we partner with um, Total Care and Fidelis. They have certified application counselors who can um, sign people up for Medicaid, Child Health Plus, and um, any exchange plans during the years. Um, and, um, but we also get a lot of phone calls. Um, you know, I've gotten phone calls about I'm moving my elderly parent up and I need information about what the options are. Well, we don't do that kind of thing. So we do a lot of referring people. Um, so it's uh, it's a little bit harder to um, quantify and track without us spending all day long like writing down everything we do. Um, but that's part of the services that we provide. Um, we have limited funding for diagnostic tests for um, patients at the free clinic, um, and that has made a huge difference um, because people come in they often can't afford the tests that um, our doctors would like to order and we actually, they can't order as many tests as they would like because we can't afford it and we can't pay for them all either, but um, uh, that's been a really helpful program. Next slide. Um, and then we have our own financial assistance program. If, for those of you who might have known the health fund in its heyday, 
we're in a new phase, um, a little bit pared down, hoping to build back up. Um, so we've got these six categories um, that we'll provide limited funding for. It's not like if you, uh, and this is for income qualified patients, so um, you have to uh, meet the, our more generous income guidelines, but they're still um, you know, low to uh, low moderate income. Um, and uh, we pay uh, to the provider. So if you need a root canal, we had someone uh, come in and get a root canal grant recently. Um, we can fund up to $200 of that. Now, if you know anything about dental bills, that does not pay for your root canal. But it makes a dent. And that dent has helped uh, a lot of people get care who otherwise would have put it off in one case, we were able to leverage a tooth extraction grant um, uh, to get some work, work with other sources to get someone a huge amount of work. But there was this gap. And we were, because of this grant, um, we were able to fill that gap. Um, and this person is getting um, almost a mouthful of new teeth. Next slide. Um, so, those are the thing, ways you can um, be a health ally and part of our alliance. I think I had some, something here that must not have come through that said, join our alliance and be a health ally. Um, you can donate, you can refer people, you can learn at our education programs, and we have uh, a, a panel coming up on Tuesday at the library at 4 o'clock. Um, uh, Lyme, um, Lyme disease, um, and you can visit if you need care or um, if you want to take a tour, um, and you can volunteer. You can learn a lot more on our website, which I'll have at the end. So that's a little bit about the health <coughs> um, Next slide. So what's happening in Tompkins County? We've got a lot going on in our county. Um, we've got a lot going on. It's one of the reasons that our members, our health outcomes numbers are good. Um, because we have at the Health Planning Council where um, everyone, um, all of these uh, folks come to the table, including um, the Health Alliance um, and um, all kinds of nonprofit agencies come to the table with the Health Planning Council um, and think about what we can do to improve things in our community. And out of that, we've gotten things like um, the Creating Healthy Places Coalition, which um, has helped make the Cuba Waterfront Trail, um, has uh, been doing streets alive. Um, you know, we have uh, the counties identified diabetes education as a priority, so there are these um, diabetes education um, classes, free. So the Human Services Coalition is? The Human Services Coalition, the Health Plan Council is part of the Human Services Coalition. It's a okay. project of the Human Services Coalition okay. that brings together, the idea is to bring together okay. all these different um, people involved in health care and uh, health policy and thinking about um, so there, there are monthly forums with um, different presentations. And, um, I'm in one of the people. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. Great. Oh, and there, by the way, there are Yeah, so um, this is for people who are not diabetic but are at risk and want to prevent becoming diabetic. Oh, um, STAP is Southern Tier AIDS Project, um, and so they provide, um, they don't provide so much care, but they provide, uh, like physical health care, but they provide um, uh, HIV testing, they provide case management, um, they provide hep C testing, they have all kinds of, um, they have needle exchange programs, so um, we 
all of us who <laughs> work with them really um, in various ways. The Ivy Clinic um, is uh, Arnett Ogden's HIV um, care program that they have a, a clinic that meets once a week in Ithaca and they, they rent space from us, from the Health Alliance. So, um, so these are some of the, I mean, so STEP, you know, maybe is not exactly direct care, but they're, they're in the Next slide. Um, we do have programs for people who are uninsured and uninsured. I mean, obviously there's the free clinic. Um, um, there's a free cancer screenings program um, for colonoscopies and reproductive cancers. Um, for uh, people over certain age groups who are uninsured, they get free colonoscopy, free pap smears, uh, and I think there's one more. Um, but if you're under that age, you don't qualify. Um, for farm workers, there's there is a migrant worker health program um, that goes. Not, not so much in Tompkins County, but in adjacent counties. Um, they may come into Tompkins County. I don't know that much about it. Um, we do occasionally have farm workers who come to us. Um, uh, Urgent Rx is a, a program that helps people who come to the free clinic, uh, to the hospital emergency room, to convenient care, um, and who are um, patients at, uh, uh, outpatients at Cuban Medical Center to get free two-week uh, prescriptions for acute illnesses. So if you um, have, have a respiratory infection and you need two weeks of an um, if you have, uh, uh, if they, they actually have, a, um, I think, uh, one of the steroid inhalers is on there. You can get a two-week worth of prescription for free at those sites. Um, and that's uh, developed by the Human Services Coalition um, and the United Way. Um, there's uh, mental health um, providers. Um, Family and Children's has a sliding scale. Karen um, Mental Health has a sliding scale. Suicide Prevention, of course, their, their programs are free and um, they definitely um, fill the great need um, and Planned Parenthood also has a sliding scale and does not turn any for black um, So we do have some services. Next one. And as I said, we have a lot going on with health and wellness and prevention. That doesn't mean <laughs> there's the diabetes and diabetes prevention process. That doesn't mean that um, that everyone is healthy or knows about, um, either knows about uh, some of these things or is able to take advantage of some of these things. And um, there's lots of reasons for that, um, which I'll get into in a minute. But, um, you know, there is a lot of um, tobacco cessation support um, in our county. There's also still a whole bunch of people who smoke, <laughs> um, even though it's less than in many other places. Um, because you know, as you know, it's like it's it's a pretty serious addiction, and it's not easy to stop. Next slide. Um, okay, so this let's go. Okay, so here's the questions. <laughs> Um, let's go to the next slide, actually. Um, yeah. So, I want to talk about barriers to care. Um, or I can even say barriers to health. Some of these have nothing to do with um, socioeconomic demographics. Anxiety or denial around health issues or doctors is an unfortunately very widespread phenomenon. Um, bureaucracy, our healthcare system is so full of bureaucracy. 
I'm not going to say that some of it isn't there for good reasons. Um, some of it isn't there for good reasons, but um, where, whether it's for good reasons or not, um, we have so much bureaucracy around healthcare that um, we often say at the Health Alliance that um, those of us who are in staff who have are college educated find it intimidating and we know a lot. <laughs> and we do these things all the time and we find it intimidating. Um, but when I met with Bob and Fred uh, initially about, um, about talking today, uh, I was saying that I think that one of the biggest barriers towards um, good health and access to health care is poverty. And it's one of the things that you know we don't talk about. Well, let's let's put a band-aid here, let's put a band-aid there, we're gonna have this program, we're gonna have that program. But um, until we really don't have um, the kind of income inequity, the kind of um, cultural inequity um, that we have uh, all over this country and in Tompkins County, there's going to be barriers to good health. Um, and we're not going to have a healthy community. Next slide. Um, so some of the some of the barriers to care, there's, I put shame at the top there. Um, there's, there's different kinds of shame that, um, that get in people's way. If they don't have, um, if they can't afford care, or they don't have insurance, um, uh, people who are living in poverty might feel shame about, about that. Um, people who are not, uh, who are not functioning at 100% regardless of their socioeconomic background, um, we have this idea that we're just supposed to be functional, and when we don't, sometimes we feel shame. We apologize. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I'm not perfect. Um, and that goes into healthcare as well. Um, or we don't apologize, but it's still underneath there. Um, there's a lot of people who don't want to hand out, um, and there's a lot of just toughing it out. Um, some people have had um, bad experiences um, with uh, a doctor or healthcare, and that can color their willingness to seek it. And here we go back to the bureaucracy. How many of you have filled out a form? You go to the doctor's office, you fill out a form. You sign up for health insurance, you fill out a form. Now you can do it on the computer with a navigator, you know, and perhaps that's easier, but even that um, still can be uh, cumbersome. And we've <clears throat> had people go on the, um, on the health exchange portal with and without um, training assistance, and um, it will ask you um, what you, is your it pulls your income from two years ago, and it asks if your income next year will be the same. <laughs> sure. um, and if you say no, then you start having to produce documentation and insight. But, you know, I know someone who um, tried to give the documentation, it wasn't accepted, and they had to give different documentation. So even the, even the, the supposedly easy to use, um, and it's way better than many others than New York State Health Insurance Portal because it's bureaucracy. Um, there's a lot of anxieties. There's a lot of questions that people might um, that might keep people from from getting health care. What if I don't qualify? What if I can't afford it? Um, no, I'm not going to go um, seek that care because I can't afford it. I mean, we've had to send people to the emergency room and they're they're concerned about you know like well do i really need to go and you know we're saying no actually the physician is saying you really need to go we will help you with the charitable care application later but you really need to go um that was a, a gentleman who had potential appendicitis it's like, no, you, it turned out he didn't actually have appendicitis but it was something serious um, and you know we need 
it, it's, well, I myself, I've had a high deductible plan for years, and um, I, uh, I had an episode um, of what was probably bald bladder pain, and um, uh, my partner and I were saying, well, I was driving before the pain, but um, <laughs> we, were, we were debating whether, whether she should take me to the emergency room or, or not, and it fortunately started to back off enough that um, we decided that I could go and have a doctor's instead. Um, but it's, it's, <laughs> it's kind of weird that we have to have these conversations. Um, uh, and I'm glad I didn't go to the emergency room because, of course, I was, you know, took much less time and all that stuff. But um, what if I can't take the time off of work? What if I have kids or um, somebody I'm looking after and I can't uh, get somebody to watch them? What if I don't have transportation? Um, these things can make a huge difference for people. Um, and those of us who don't have those barriers to Next slide. Um, recently, we had someone uh, contact us who's a grad student at Brown, an international student, um, here with his family. And he said, um, I'm being told that um, we can't get care, that uh, we can't get care for this family member because of a pre existing condition. So we're all scratching our heads and saying, I thought that the Affordable Care Act was supposed to take care of that. Well, um, it did. It's not that this family can't get insurance, but there is a loophole where the insurance companies can um, deny specific services um, because of pre existing condition for people who are not um, US residents. Now, here in Ithaca, we have a lot of people in this situation. And uh, it was something like there had the person had once had bronchitis. Oh, oh my god! Um, I don't I don't remember the details because I didn't speak directly to the person, but I was coaching one of our volunteers um, in the initial call. Um, I talked about high deductibles. Um, yes, people are getting um, coverage um, under the Affordable Care Act um, if they, uh, depending on what they're eligible for and what plan they chose they may have um, fairly high out-of-pocket costs. So, you know, yes, you have insurance, but can you afford the COVID? Yes, you have insurance, but if you have uh, something serious, you know, and your maximum out-of-pocket is $5,000, do you have that? Um, there is some, some help for that for people who get silver plans, but then the premiums are high. Um, they may get help with the premium, but can they afford the premium? So, um, and of course there's no dental care. There's no dental coverage. Um, so there's a lot of people who don't, uh, who have to pay out of pocket for dental or don't get dental care. Um, and vision care uh, is also not Abby, hearing, I would assume, too, with hearing aids and hearing... I don't know about hearing aids. I don't know. But hearing tests. I don't know. I'm sorry. I don't know. I thought that's a good um, point. If you're, lucky, if you're lucky, people go around. I had one for the college. If, if you're lucky, you'll find one. When yeah, they have a test, I just, just uh -huh. you know, so... It goes with those extra, yeah. extra things. Yeah, yeah. What is OOB? Out of pocket. Oh, ah, okay. Sorry. That's okay. I should have <laughs> noted it in S. Happy for Oops. Next slide. I, I don't like that kind of time. I'm confused. Um, and then there's, um, there's people who aren't getting care because um, of cultural barriers. Um, there's things that we don't. Um, well, and I'm going to say we because from what it looks like to me, and I, I'm making an assumption that um, everybody in this room who looks Caucasian is Caucasian. Um, I know that that's not always a good assumption to make, but um, so if anybody is, is uh, not, please forgive me. Um, 
but it's very easy for us to make uh, assumptions about things that um, are big realities for other people. Um, uh, there are different, um, there are different attitudes toward health in different communities, and there's different practices about health in different communities. Um, and you know, in in this community, most the, the overwhelming, overwhelming, overwhelming majority of our providers are Caucasian. Um, and I say providers don't look like me. That's one thing, um, but it's it's more than that. Um, it's also you know we may think that we're communicating one thing, and it may be communicating a host of other things, or not be communicating. Um, and we may think we're listening, and we may not be hearing what's really being really said. Um, you know, and then uh, the the providers at the clinic um, sometimes talk about uh, practicing at the clinic as being like third world medicine um, in terms of. Um, that they, they can't just, you know, do kind of what they're used to. Um, this isn't about the patient so much, but, um, uh, that, you know, they can't just order as many tests as they want, and that they find that the patients have all these other things going on, like they don't have enough food, or, you know, you know I, I heard a, um, something, uh, oh, it was, a, it was the TED radio hour. Um, <laughs> there was a, <laughs> There was a woman talking about this clinic, an organization of clinics that she runs, and I think they take insurance, but um, they called something like Health Connect, and how um, their doctors are can write a prescription for heat or food, and then that they take that to, um, then they have advocates who help people get those programs. Well, I was thinking, and, and you know, like how this is like this brand new idea, and I was thinking, Oh yeah, free clinics have been doing this for years. Um, it's good. It's good. It's getting more press, you know. But um, uh, you know, it's hard to to ask somebody to you know take care of themselves in certain ways when there's you know unbelievable things going on and they don't have running water or um, you know we had a patient who. Didn't have whose utility bill was turned off, who, um, who had a medical condition that made that um, a problem, and, and it took a lot of work to work. And, you know, and NYSEG has has a program, but you still have to bureaucracy, bureaucracy, bureaucracy. Forms, forms, forms. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, next slide. Um, health insurance does not equal health care. A lot of people are saying, oh, the Affordable Care Act, isn't everybody going to be covered now? Well, first of all, no. <laughs> not everybody will be covered. Um, and even if they are, um, you know, I think you're getting the idea that having health insurance is only part of what it means to have access to health care. Um, uh, there is mental health uh, coverage under the um, Affordable Care Act has been expanded, but it still um, uh, doesn't cover um, long-term psychotherapy. Um, and I'm sure there's a limit. I don't remember, but I, I know there's a limit on the inpatient stay. So, um, you know, fortunately, a lot of people can can get by on what the limits are, but there are definitely people who can't. Um, so here are some structural changes that would have a big impact on good health and access to health care if we had universal health care, really universal health care. Um, the Affordable Care Act is not universal health care. It's, uh, it's more health care. It's more health insurance. <laughs> it's not universal health care. Um, our working conditions. Um, 
I'm not just talking about, I mean, first of all, you know, you, you can talk about Walmart or you know, some place like that where the pay is, is poor and, um, but I mean just in general, for us to have good health um, when the norm in our society has become overworking, um, I find that that's, uh, I think that that's uh, a big barrier. Um, food justice, you know, when people can, eating food is essential to good health. It's pretty basic. Um, and I know there's a lot of really great efforts in our county that, um, to that end. And um, when I say multidimensional equity, I mean educational equity, I mean income equity, and you know, like there's there's so many um, ways that we need to, to change. And, and those are the kinds of changes that I think ultimately will work towards good health. Um, and there is a, um, um, Eric Clay is starting a project, which I'm sure he's coming to talk to you about at some point, about strengthening informal primary care providers. Um, you know, uh, one of our um, volunteers is a medical anthropology professor at Ithaca College, and she says uh, there's a whole um, film about mothers as primary care providers. And we are our own primary care providers. Um, so the more that we can learn to take care of ourselves and each other in some really basic ways. Next slide. Okay, so here's the questions. What would a truly integrated approach to health look like? And when I say truly integrated, I'm bringing back in the, um, the notion that um, acupuncture, um, naturopathy, chiropractic, massage therapy, the, the uh, herbal medicine, these things um, are really essential to an integrated health system along with um, conventional medicine. Um, and if we were able to really make them work together, um, I think that that would lead to much greater health. Better health than just having, uh, uh, than just having um, universal health insurance. Uh, and most universal health insurance is not even talking about health um, So, these next two questions, I was thinking, well, what is, what does a sustainable healthcare system look like? What would, what would it mean if the system was sustainable? But then, what's sustainable for health for each person? Um, getting back into the overwork and how we set things up in our society. Um, you know, you may have heard that in Spain there, you know, there's been all this pressure to do away with the siesta. Is that sustainable? I, I mean, I'm not Spanish. What do I know? But it doesn't sound good to me. Um, you mean to do away with it? To do away with it. Well, yeah. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> but, but I, I think we should all be copying it. It's all about people going home and having a big meal with their family. It's not just a little nap. It's a right. way of socially, you know, right. um, connecting. Well, it's a little more complicated. Italy does the same thing. And, and the meal is not so big. But also, you look at the Mediterranean countries during the summer, it's hot there, and we can watch the world. And then people come back and work like night too. It's not like 10 if you look, If you look at the order in which they eat their meals, that's very different too. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. The way we eat is so unhealthy. So. Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> But and also not compartmentalizing everything. You know, nutrition is is part of you know good health. It's huge. And what you need prevention and psychological. We put everything into the boxes, and of course, the lower you are on the income scale, you you, you can't. 
can think like that when mm -hmm. everything is in the circle. That's very sad. You know, very sad that the consumerism is killing us. So how can we do things differently locally? Um, we do a lot of things differently locally, but are there other things we can do? Um, Bob and Fred, when I met with them, were saying uh, something about a group in Chicago that um, is creating sort of like a healthcare care mm -hmm. um, I've since learned the term medical home. Yeah. Oh, that's an experiment where um, the insurance company gives a lump sum payment for the health care of someone during a year. And usually someone who's been in the hospital and now they're out, and the doctor's job is to keep them from going back to the hospital. So if they don't go back to the hospital, the doctor earns money. Mm -hmm. So they have nurses and other things telling them take a pill and calling them on the phone and pestering them about being yeah, responsible. Yeah, that's, that's something that's been talked about at the Health Planning Council, and that is being um, encouraged. There's incentives under the Affordable Care Act. But um, I thought that, uh, and maybe it was Fred who said this about, um, could we have you know, a contract for health care locally? Right. Um, and I, uh, my feeling was, I thought that um, we should work with state uh, universal health care um, rather than try, that's my, that was my opinion. Um, uh, but that's what I wanted to, you know, bring up and encourage people to talk about this. Morning. Could I, could yeah. I talk about that? Yeah, this is, I mean, this is what I, this is the part where I want, I'm, we're raising these questions that I'm Yeah, I wasn't all sure what, how you felt discussion. about us interrupting you, but maybe it's, it's a fine. good time. As you're going through the slides, the first thing, this is. This is the last, I mean, the other slide is my contact information. Now I want us to talk. Okay. <laughs> So um, as we were going through, I saw a couple of times you mentioned religion. One of them was where you said uh, religion can be a barrier to health care. The thing that occurred to me is that, um, let's say in the Jewish tradition of kosher food, mm -hmm. um, to what extent could we say that religions are in fact a method of health care, that religions build up uh, well, let's say in the Seventh-day Adventists, they have uh, a certain attitude towards uh, vegetarian food or something like that. I don't know too much details. But many religions seem to have mandated eating practices and perhaps mandated health care practices. So what I'm wondering about in this context is to what extent can a religion take on some of the local responsibility for actually encouraging people to be healthy? which doesn't prevent the state from taking responsibility, but I'm wondering to what extent can religion be a positive force? Well, I wouldn't say so much religion, but religious communities um, locally can be a positive force, drawing on um, each of our traditions. Um, and I think that's what Eric is after in his project. Um, it is, um, building on the fact that we have many religious communities in Tompkins County and how can we um, how can we uh, stimulate more um, people more I mean just community itself um, has health promoting practices so um, you know I, I think I think there's a lot. Could you tell us more about this project, Eric? Uh, um, Eric who? Eric Clay, okay. <coughs> with Shared Journeys. I, I don't know that I can speak that authoritatively about it. It's something that he's starting up and um, was looking to get some funding for um, about uh, trying to get, do have there be some, some trainings um, and encourage and, and do some tracking of health outcomes. Um, and well, is it about diet? Them. Is it about diet, eating vegetables, fruits, instead of? Um, I think it was more food. about informal care networks, building up our informal care networks so that we're oh. taking better care of each other. Mm -hmm. 
you know, you can educate, you know, in outreach, educate through the churches, but then the consciousness of the church itself has to be raised to a level, the information level about nutrition. It's very complicated. And it makes me very sad. Especially the children. I mean, I think yeah. you do a great job, you know. Well, as I said, children in New York State have um, good access to health insurance, but if they don't have enough to eat. It's also not just having enough to eat, it's having the way the food that's and then there's exactly And a lot of the food pantries, you know, it's a dumping ground um, for, for, yes. for people that, you know, can take a tax deduction for corporations. Right. So what we really need to change is policy. I mean, Brookendale Food Bank, food and community food, that is the most gorgeous, that's the exception to the rule. Not talking about kind of actions. Yeah. I think there's a lot. And Southern Tier, Southern Tier is, mm -hmm. has been cut. Um, one question, the providers at the Ithaca Health Alliance, um, don't, you don't take insurance no. claim. What would be required for Ithaca Health Alliance to become an HMO, to have paid staff that take insurance? We would have to create an entirely new um, uh, organization or subsidiary because we're a 501c3. Um, we are not, uh, and we are not set up as a medical clinic. Um, there's a, a Section uh, 128 of New York State, um, that in order to um, be a medical facility, we don't have to comply with all those regulations. So we would have to reorganize. Um, would that be a desirable path for the Health Alliance? Um, I'm going to say probably not. Um, to become an, the thing is, you can't just, I mean, even if we were to um, reorganize and be able to take insurance, the healthcare system is much more complex than just one clinic. You know, we can do this, what we can do for people in our clinic, but, you know, even if you, you know, for example, my son, um, uh, hurt his arm at um, uh, at school playing handball, um, and the school nurse thought that it was a sprain and um, sent him home. Um, and then it really wasn't better the next day, and he was walking around like this because it hurt to do anything else. And, um, and he said it hurt, and I called her um, uh, after school, and uh, or she she called me and she said I think you should take him to the doctor. And it was after school, and um, I called the doctor's office, and they were like, well, it's, it's getting late, and we're just going to send you up to the hospital for an x-ray. So just go. So we could do what we could do. You know, it's like we have to send people to the hospital. The hospital has a whole other set of regulations. We can't, um, uh, and I was thinking about this, like, healthcare cooperative idea, and I was thinking, well, anybody who's eligible for Medicaid, they would be, We'd have to figure out some way that they could be part of the cooperative, and I don't know if Medicaid would go for that. Um, it's it's a very complex regulatory environment, so um, I'm not saying it's not worth thinking about, but um, I see us going more in the direction of providing advocacy and financial assistance and, and education. Uh, and continuing to provide holistic care and advocate for that um, being part of our system, which is, again, not going to be addressed by um, any kind of HMO or traditional um, you know, conventional uh, and, and those people, like I was saying, you know, I said to people, I've had acupuncture, I think that they can get you. Uh -huh. you know, or I like to do, you know, keep on and they look at you. You see, that's the kind of, you know, I'm telling you, the bumping up of a kind of consciousness. Mm -hmm. I mean, acupuncture really worked for me. Mm -hmm. 
but you know, if you're down here and you're worrying about, you know, your groceries, you know, and, and you say, well, what is that? You know, and you've just been used to, to you know, going to a doctor or something like that. It takes a whole, um, uh, I don't know, education, but a whole information level bumped up to to say, you know, we offer this too. And maybe this is a, you know, maybe this is an option that we want to explore. I love the world we live in, you know, but for me, it's been, it's been a path, mm-hmm. you know, and it's a matter, it's a matter of having those other people take that first step and follow the path. This is a But tell me about sustainability. I mean, we have a whole center in this place called, you know, the Center for Sustainability. And everybody uses the word. And I'm not sure that everybody uses it, but sometimes people use it just because everybody's talking about sustainability. I think that's true. Does this just mean, <laughs> does this just mean that when you say what is needed for sustainable health, that, that in my world, you know, I, I should look for the things that will allow me as an advocate or as a person to get the best out of a health system to, to make my health the best? Is that what sustainability means? Um, well, I think that we could probably, um, in, in, a Jewish, in a Jewish culture, we have a saying, three Jews for our opinions. I think we could, okay. I think we could have, have a lot of um, different, what I was thinking there is um, not just what could I do with the healthcare system to what would be sustainable for um, me in in my everyday way I do things in how I interact with health? And how does that how does that um, relate to um, the systemic problems that we have? You know, so I, yes, um, I think. Okay. I'm sorry, sorry. Well, I was interested in knowing what you think of the advantages of universal healthcare. I think the advantages are high. <laughs> I'm totally in favor of, of, you know, some kind of like Medicare for all system. Uh, Can you get exclusive? Mm-hmm. Well, we'd have to have Rebecca here really to um, <laughs> to tell us, but but um, to take the to to first of all, you know, you talk about the forms, forms, forms bureaucracy. I'm not saying there wouldn't be them, but there would only be one kind, only one kind. Uh, in terms of the health insurance, um, would it be insurance? Uh, in terms of the billing, yeah, but you have one, one, one set you know, of agents, and you wouldn't be <laughs> trying to. Um, you could just go to the next slide briefly. This has got just has our information. Um, uh, so that would be, you know, we'd be able to actually say. Here's what you do, and it would be like the same for everybody. Can you imagine? Instead of here's what you do if you have Etna, here's what you do if you have, you know, Excel. Um, okay. okay, I was going to just, I was just going to add that economically, it's a very feasible system because it puts us on a level, a level playing field with other countries. If you take GM in Canada, GM in the U.S. They'd much rather be in Canada because they're paying so much less for insurance because it is um, a delivery, I'm sorry, a financial system that's centralized. The doctors would be able to spend so much more time with their patients. They wouldn't have to be told, they wouldn't be told you cannot do this because it's not profitable for the insurance company for you to have this patient go through you know, this surgery. Um, take the stress off people, they wouldn't have to, you know, think, do I have, worry actually, do I get food, do I go to the doctor, you just present your card. It would be done by sliding scale, a, a payroll tax, and if you don't make enough, well, you're still covered. So people at the top of the economic ladder and people at the bottom would be entitled to the same exact care and be treated as a mesh, as a person. You wouldn't be looked at culturally or class. Although I have to say, from what I understand in the Canadian system, you 
can still buy private health insurance. And the British and, <laughs> and people who have more money can go see private doctors. There is still options. But the baseline is that everybody has access. Is that, is that true in uh, Norway and Denmark? I don't know. No. The best system is France for single payer. Is the best yeah, system. Have there been any good economic studies of what the impact is on these countries that have a... Uh, you know, they don't think about it. But, they, but they I mean, has anybody done an economic study of those countries that do have universal health care there, versus yes, that there, don't? There are, there are studies. There, there, are, there are studies. I would get to see this. I haven't seen what, them. what so, it costs the government? Well, what, you what the impact well, the, is on the economy as a whole? General, yeah, I would say there, there is. You can look over. I would think Dr. Shao, who formulated the, the uh, Vermont single payer system, and he did the Taiwan. I would, I would think Gerald Friedman is another economist of it, um, at a university in Am of Mass in Amherst. There, there are studies. They look at cost and you know, you know, look, no system is perfect. None. But which is the best one for the majority, you know, for well, people, for the people. We are the government in this country. The two that people in my family have had exposure to have been great. I mean, it was in Norway and Canada. Yeah, I, I, I met someone. In, in Canada, I have been, I lived up there for a while. There was nobody. And these people were under the regular system. They didn't have private insurance. They were a company. And they did have nurses that came, as, as your slide pointed out, nurses and community people to come either and visit with them or to check in with them. A Britain has, for people that just have a baby, they have a system where the nurse will come and work with the parent. Um, it's a much more, and it's not that our system can't be hands-on, but we don't let, we, we're more interested in the profit mode of the capitalist. So we need to change the mentality here. We to change. Do you have any ideas about how we would pursue that? Changing the mentality of people? We need to start talking to one another. If not, we're going to need new degrees and have to talk and listen and make eye contact. We need to start looking at each other in terms of community. Get a grassroots. Right, absolutely. We're not a community-oriented community system. The U.S. is not community oriented, and that's what we need to start. But we made a lot of inroads with respect to smoking, and and you know it, it's that's not right. it's not model. easy and it takes time. But you know I I have nobody around me who smokes, and and you know they, just the same. They, there's a recent film that was going around on single payer. And um, I saw it, and what an incredible thing, talking about young people and also talking about uh, mothers having children and, and or families and them then becoming the advocates or, uh, advocates or teaching. There was a young couple in this film, and I don't know if the child had, um, was going to be a difficult pregnancy, but you know, they could just move across Canada, and I think they did. They went to another province or so something. So what, what's the yeah. point you're making? The let me finish. Could I finish? We have one okay. minute. One minute. That's okay. One minute. Um, the projector is needed elsewhere, and we are grateful for you for coming and talking with us. Thanks very much. Thanks.